Thursday, the 9th of November, European stocks just off session highs. Industrials are leading. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. European equities inch higher. We're up by seven tenths of one percent. We're now trading 447. Yesterday, 444. We made gains. Auto Trader uh, is up by 8.4 percent today. The business mix looks good. They're making money. And also, I think this speaks to the kind of the resilience, the strength maybe of the used car market at the moment, which I think is fascinating given what is happening with the macro picture. Auto Trader bounces, Agin bouncing massively. But you remember what happened in August? This stock got slammed as it had to change guidance. Today they come out with an investor day and delivered maybe more realistic guidance and a detailed plan as to how they're going to get there. The stock recoups some of the losses that we delivered in the summer, but not all of them. So just take that near 40% move today with a little pinch of salt, Alex. I uh, definitely will. Yeah, perspective there. So the S&P flat, uh, if it does close higher, it would be nine straight days of gains. Haven't seen that since 20, uh, 2004. Uh, Becton Dickinson, along with Eli Lilly, are the worst performing stocks in the S&P. Uh, disappointed on results. That's not getting hit quite hard. Um, two other things to pay attention to. One, the 30-year yield. We get the auction today at 1 p.m. The 10-year was okay. The auction went all right. They, you definitely had to offer more yield to get that. But what to pay, want to pay attention to is 4.69. That's the 50-day moving average. So trading around that technically as we head into the auction will be quite interesting. A crew getting a little bit of a relief up by almost 2%. Just some follow-through here from uh, yesterday. Uh, we had the Saudis push back against speculators, blaming them, of course, for the downside in the market. So definitely uh, check that part out. But I still think, Guy, that bonds well off their 16-year highs is quite interesting. Yeah, um, it's just interesting to see what's happening with financial conditions more broadly. So what you've got is yields coming down quite sharply over the last few days, equity markets rallying really quite significantly. And that takes us back to the question that we're trying to get to today. How do central banks respond to that? Are central banks all on the same page with the bond market right now? I give you exhibit A here, which I think kind of encapsulates everything. This is the financial conditions story on both sides of the Atlantic. The blue line is, is the Eurozone, the white line is the United States. The higher this goes, this is the Bloomberg uh, financial conditions uh, number, the higher this goes, the looser financial conditions are getting. And you can see the spike that we get here. So this is all the way back to 2021. Financial condition tighten, 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 then start to loosen. And you get this period here where rates go sharply higher, stock markets sl get slide, financial conditions tighten. At that point, central banks were saying, this is great. We're seeing the market doing some of the heavy lifting for us. The problem is, though, since then, we've gone back above zero. We've now got looser financial conditions. Are the central banks, are Powell and guard going to have to respond to this? Yeah, I mean, that's Bowman just saying that she does expect further rate hikes needed. So maybe there is the pushback now on the more hawkish side. So last hour, we spoke to Shanali Peer, portfolio manager for high yield and multi-sector credit at PIMCO. And here's what she had to say about the Fed's calculations. The initial move wider in rates certainly was the market helping the Fed do its job. But I think at this point, um, given the rising risks with geopolitical risk, with um, you know the broader economy, the Fed has reemphasized the data dependence. I think they're going to continue to buy time as they look through the data and, and try to sift out what their next move may be. That brings us back to our question of the day. Paul Lagarde, the bond market. Are they still on the same page? Joining us now, Scully Montgomery Koning, T.S. Lombard, head of macro strategy. The central banks liked it when the market was doing the work for them. Yields were going higher. Financial conditions were tightening. Now we get the reverse. What happens next? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's been a problem throughout this tightening cycle, right? The market quickly jumps from the last hike through the pause to cuts. That loosens financial conditions, loosening the squeeze on growth and inflation, and counteracting what central banks are trying to achieve by tightening. So it makes sense, you know, to err on the side of hawkishness if you're a central bank that's worried about these loosening financial conditions. In terms of bond markets getting along with central bankers' views, you know, 
Powell has been helped, I think, by the resilience of the economy. That's pushed out cuts onto a timeline that looks fairly consistent with what the Fed is thinking, mm -hmm. especially as inflation has come down. So yes, we've seen a significant rally in the past week, but we're still above those 2022 peak levels in yields. For the ECB, I think it's a different story. You know, the market isn't really buying Lagarde's hawkishness. Cuts have been brought in as the ECB has said that they aren't even thinking about them. Right. And that's again, a reflection of the data. So then to that point, the Fed can push back, and we just heard from Bowman, right, pushing back against uh, the potential, pushing for the potential for more hikes. The ECB can't. So how does that wind up playing out for an investor? Like, how do you, how do you game that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think, you know, largely we've seen this be a growth story, right? So you've got U.S. exceptionalism, and I think that's set to continue. You've got two big growth engines in the world, the U.S. and China. China is bottoming, but it's not stimulating Europe. So that means the U.S. is going to continue to outperform, and you're going to continue to see this divergence in expectations for the Fed versus the ECB. And so we've played that out in terms of having a preference for European bonds over U.S. bonds. It's also played out in equity space as well as being an, an FX trade that's played quite well. Is there a danger, though, that Europe has a bigger inflation problem? And as a result of which, while growth may slow, inflation will be sluggish to come down. And yes, we are seeing disinflation at the moment, but it may be a struggle to get from 4 to 3 to 2 percent. And there's a danger that we get a reacceleration. We're very much focused at the moment in terms of the divergence on growth. But how is it going to work when we look at inflation? Yes, absolutely. I mean, so inflation was higher in Europe, but I think you have to go back to 2022 and we had this reemergence of inflation and this inflation rate that was getting very, very high. The drivers of inflation in Europe were different than the drivers of inflation in the U.S. The U.S. It was the fiscal outlook. It was demand driven. It was consumers and margin expansion. Whereas in Europe, it was largely a supply issue in the first instance. That's not saying demand didn't play a role. But in the first instance, it was a supply issue, and the ECB didn't want to fall behind the Fed, both in terms of, you know, not being as attractive to investors, but also because the currency depreciation they were worried about would trigger inflation. So because it was a supply issue in Europe in the first instance, it's coming out quite quickly. Mm -hmm. You're also seeing that European inflation lags U.S. inflation. So we got the peak in the U.S. very convincingly in a, this big downtrend, and we're starting to get that now in Europe. And so we think disinflation will, in Europe will continue into the end of the year quite strongly, and it won't be as hard then for the ECB to be angling towards cuts as growth slows. So basically, the term premium was higher in the U.S. because of that supply picture. That's now, in essence, being wrung out of the market. Uh, Europe didn't have that dynamic. If Europe does start to have that dynamic, we were talking to someone last hour, where it's like they are going to stimulate in some capacity, they're just slower and behind the U.S. What happens then? Yeah, I mean, there's never as much fiscal space in Europe, right? Because the U.S. has this exorbitant privilege because it's the world's reserve currency. Um, they're also, you know, they can print as much money as they want for government bonds. And, you know, they can issue as many government bonds as they want because there's always been that demand because they are the world reserve currency. The issue for Europe is you have all of these different countries issuing bonds that, you know, they have different debt to GDP ratios and they all share the same monetary policy and they all share the same currency. And so there yeah. is more fiscal head, you know, headwinds in terms of that. You know, people are starting to worry about the periphery now. They're starting to worry about Italy. And so you can't get that same kind of loosening in fiscal that you get in the U.S. Um, so, you know, I don't see it as being as much of a headwind for European bonds. Scarlett, back in the 70s, Burns, Volcker, we got a head fake as inflation came down, but then it reaccelerated. Are we convinced... Are we really convinced that there is no danger that we see a reacceleration at this point, a significant reacceleration, and central banks may actually really struggle at that point to deliver a policy that the market is comfortable with? I, we may have to hike again. How convinced are we that we're not seeing a replay of that movie? Yeah, I mean, so I wouldn't say we're seeing a complete replay in terms of I don't think we get inflation levels back to 8%, 7%. But certainly, there's a risk that inflation reaccelerates again. If the U.S. economy stays strong, the consumer stays strong, margin expansion comes back, you know, you've got these destabilizing forces that now are just a part of the economy, like geopolitical risks that lead to supply yeah. shocks that cause inflation to come higher again. And so, you know, all of that is now a feature of the economy. That means that for us, we see 2% inflation as a floor mm -hmm. rather than a ceiling. 
post-COVID cycle. So it's certainly a worry from here. Right, between the two to three. Um, all right, hey, Skyler, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Skyler Montgomery Koning of TS Lombard. Thank you. All right, coming up, Siemens reportedly reaching an agreement with German government to cover billions in project-related financial guarantees. I should say Siemens Energy. Siemens is the big shareholder of Siemens Energy. We're going to talk through this with Vestas Wind System President and CEO Henrik Anderson about how that news will impact his company, the role of governments in this energy transition, and where we are with offshore wind. This is Bloomberg. Big news in the energy space. The German government has said to have agreed to cover billions of euros in project-related guarantees for Siemens Energy. A large portion of Siemens Energy business is offshore wind. They do other stuff too, but offshore wind, which has been really struggling. And they said to keep building offshore wind stuff, they need different kind of guarantees from the government. Here with the latest is Bloomberg German economy correspondent uh, Oliver Crook. At the same time, we also heard the government might also help provide BASF, the chemical maker, uh, some lower prices for energy. What is this all telling us right now, Oliver? I mean, there's no shortage of issues with these big industrial companies here in Germany. I mean, the Siemens Energy one was a particularly difficult one because it was really one of these new economy stocks, right? Until June, when this all went down, this was the best performing stock on the DAX. And then they had all these issues with their turbines uh, to dealing with the uh, Spanish unit Gamesa, which has just completely destroyed. We're talking about value destruction of 70% at one point of the stock. It's now worth less than half of what it was earlier in the year. Um, and this is all down to these wind turbines turbines that just do not function properly. So what we have now is a deal. We have some backstop that involves, yes, the German government. It involves also Siemens, the parent company, um, and some other parties. We have to assume that the banks will play some role in this. But when I spoke to the Siemens CEO about this a couple months ago, he was not, we won't say fuming openly, but he was saying, basically, you need to talk to the Siemens energy people about this. This is their issue. We help, we're confident we can resolve it, but we hope it's not going to take too much time. This is confirmation, Oli, isn't it, that the energy transition cannot be handled by the private sector alone. And it's becoming increasingly clear with the IRA, now with this support here in Europe, that governments are going to have to step in in a big way. How much more support do you think we're going to see in Europe? Yeah, and also, how are you going to get all of this capacity online? If this is one of the major makers of these turbines, do you have, even if you have the money, do you have the bandwidth to produce it all? I guess you'll get the answer for that from uh, your guest that's coming up very soon. But again, this is precisely the point, Guy. And with an issue like this, it's sort of a black hole problem. It's not clear how deep this goes. It's like a cavity, right? This was a similar problem. I mean, you mentioned BASF, but this is the same thing that we had with Uniper. Not exactly, because that was basically fully linked to the Russian gas question. But it's all... Um, it's all connected, and now you have the trickle down of that coming in on the new energy stocks. And again, it's going to be a major issue, and it's going to be a huge point of discussion, um, particularly as they're trying to finance this transition as the government is coming under yeah. pressure because it's costing too much. This is an ongoing story. It's a developing story. Oliver Crook in Berlin, thank you very much indeed. Siemens Argate, the, the parent company, effectively, it's not the parent company, but it's just Siemens rather than Siemens Energy, uh, is going to provide, it looks like, some sort of support here as well. The company's saying that it's in constructive talks on Siemens Energy, this according to a spokesman. Siemens saying that uh, talks are defining the best possible solution. So these talks sound like they are ongoing. Let's get some reaction to this news that we're getting from Siemens Energy and also what's happening in the sector. We saw a big pop yesterday in his share price. Henrik Andersen is the president and CEO of Vestas Wind Systems. Vestas, you can look at, look at the share price this week. The company surging yesterday. It increased its earnings outlook. The mood music has changed and the market really responding to that. Any, any kind of hint of good news and you get that kind of pop. Henrik Anderson of Vestas, welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Let's deal with the news that is happening as we speak. Yeah. This news on Siemens Energy is developing. How does that change the playing field? These are, these, this is a major competitor of yours. Yeah, no, as I said here, uh, I always, if on the belief, and I've always been grown up in that, and I think investors, we very much believe in that. Uh, over four decades, we developed our solutions. I think the combination of developing solutions, putting them up, requires an enormous discipline. Uh, we've just been through a, at least a two and a half year, uh, very uh, challenging period, but we have had uh, stability and leadership. That also means mm -hmm. we don't pass a baton to somebody else. 
And I think that's probably also a very, very important takeaway that, that companies, private companies, have to be able to run uh, themselves so, uh, Henrik, over time. Um, Henrik, it, it's Alex in New York. You're just pointing to how you were able to execute. Siemens Energy was not on this. Is this just, in essence, going to wind up state aid for all, for all these kind of companies? Like, how do you feel about that? Um, well, as I said, in, in, from a personal point of view, I'm not a supporter of, of state aid. I'm not a supporter of, 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 of a playing field where you have uh, different times and you do different measures. Uh, in generally, the uh, solution we are providing today is well uh, competitive uh, on comparison to building any new gas, any new oil, any new nuclear. So therefore, let's not go there. Uh, is, is that what this is, they say, do you think? Um, could be. Uh, I don't know. As I said, it's news. It's come out. Yep. I don't know if, if it's, 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 it's probably you should have asked uh, the Siemens Energy uh, sure. uh, C CEO. Or, Unfortunately, or he's not here. You yeah. are. He's not, he's not here. And <laughs> I am, I, clearly. But, but, as, <laughs> but as I said, I also know if you, if you need to solve a crisis in a private company, at some point in time, you have to make a stop to yep. the crisis. And if it's a capital or a financial liability uh, in a private company, at some point in time, you either have to accept it disappears and it's yeah. allowed to be yep. consolidated into the industry, or you will have to ask your, your government, or, or for that matter here, you can see that there's a parent company that, that probably has a, a meaning on it. Um, but that's, that's not where, that's, it's, a, it's a far away from where we are, and therefore, yeah, yeah, I, as I said, it, it, it influenced the, uh, the industry and we'll take uh, measures on it. Uh, well, depending well, Henrik, on let's talk about that. Is the wind crisis over? Um, and I know that's a broad stroke question, but clearly uh, uh, offshore wind is still in a boatload of trouble. The onshore market seems to be very different. Where do you think we are in those two areas evolving? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm slightly, I've, I've now had it for, for nearly three years with, with, a, with a company here where we have seen uh, big changes in, in, first of all, the, the components and also in the world of, of putting the solutions together. Um, and I think here, we've we now been hit with a couple of stop and go. We also saw that the UK uh, CFD round uh, five opens for onshore, competitive, uh, it's at a price level that is probably uh, less than half of what the current consumer price and, and, and electricity price for, for businesses. So the solution counts. And then, as I said, we have never in any time of the world been able to do big transformational journeys together without also hitting a bump on the road. So I, I'm slightly more favorable of saying we need to clear a couple of those projects that are either stocked in the backlog uh, or we need to cancel them and start all over. And I think the positive, in whether it's in the U.S. Uh, East Coast states, there is a resetting. Uh, first resetting has come out in the offtake uh, pricing. You've seen in the U.K., uh, you're running a story today where you are now also yep. uh, going towards probably more the likes of the European offtake price of, of £75 uh, pounds, uh, uh, per megawatt hour for the electricity, which is still a substantial 40% lower than the actual. Is that enough to get the, the, that, the UK back on track? I don't see any reason why at seventy-five uh, pounds per megawatt hour you shouldn't be able to build uh, out of offshore. Uh, th that that is also an indication there is a price gap between onshore and offshore, mm -hmm. uh, and that will trigger uh, some so, of the. And, and you think six? There's seven coming as well. Do you think those prices increment the, the, the rounds of uh, uh, of the, the auctions we're going to go through? Do you think incrementally those prices creep up? Uh, yes, I think so. Because right now, you see it in the UK as well, there is an inflationary uh, development and, and that still triggers some uh, price development uh, upwards. Right. Henrik, do you feel like offshore and wind is a viable thing? I feel like for me, when I talk to people, it's a binary thing. Like One is like, guys, it's way too expensive. It's never going to happen. The platforms are expensive. You're in the middle of the sea and you've got to put an electrical wire in there too. And others say, yeah, yeah, it is. We just need to wait for prices to come down and to de-risk the area. Realistically, where do you think stop we landed? Stop in it, this? stop it. Now, stop it for a second. 30 days ago, we commissioned one of the largest uh, on offshore uh, wind farms in, uh, in the UK, proudly there, together with, uh, with Alistair from SSE and Patrick Poinet from Total Energy. We just established Sea Green up there. It's, it's 114 turbines that stands outside Monroe's in Scotland. So, why it's is it so hard in the place. US? And Henrik, it, why is it so hard in the US now? Because every time you try to do something completely new, 
it's, it's hard. And, and you haven't had a tradition for doing offshore wind in the U.S., where if you now look at the onshore wind in the U.S., uh, that is, of course, with a 30-year tradition, we are building out the IRAs, uh, putting a lot more capacity and stability into the market uh, for the next 10 years. And you will see multiple gigawatts being built out in the coming quarters in the U.S. and for the next 10 years. So then you could also, uh, let me rephrase that, why is it so easy to build onshore out? Because you have done it for 30 years, you have the manufacturing capacity, and you have the solution there uh, that is ready to go to the grid. So it is, offshore is not a mature uh, product and solution yet. Uh, up until, yes, uh, last year, the whole world was only doing yeah. 5 gigawatt, mm -hmm. where the onshore was doing 75 gigawatt. So you have, last year you had a ratio 1 to 15, between onshore and offshore. So, yep. so the supply chain is not developed. We are doing it. We are building the ships to do it. Um, and as I said, I, w I wish you could be, because Sea Green is 800,000 households electricity coming off the coast of Montrose in Scotland. Yeah. Hey, come on. Couldn't be better. No. Yep. Somebody told me the statistics, like sort of every, every time it t one of these tur turbines turns, that's a house powered. Yep. Um, Amazing. Talk to me a little bit about pricing. The critical thing is you've got to be able to make money. I mean, this kind of where we started. Your, your gross margin improved significantly in the latest set of numbers. You stuck to your guns on pricing. That's starting to come good. Is that kind of margin sustainable? What do you think is going to happen on pricing? I think, the, the, first of all, the pricing is stable, positive for us. Uh, and then the surrounding uh, circumstances in the supply chain is positive as well. Right. So first of all, now we have an environment where we can transport and we can get and we can count on the agreements we are making. And of course, that gives that cost uh, into the pricing is uh, stable and then the pricing with the, uh, with the customer is stable. And that gives us a, a, a proper return on the turbines mm -hmm. when we just look towards now the construction. What we're taking as an order uh, backlog today is going to be established in 25. Yep. And some of the thing we are doing now in 23 was from the uh, very, very uh, challenging times of 2021 and half of 22. Um, and that's where we still have some lower profitable uh, contracts to execute. Also in the coming quarters, but as you've seen this year, our power solution business has nearly improved with 10% in just three quarters. Amazing. Um, to that point, on, just on cost, another issue that I hear quite a bit is that a producer of wind turbines just took on all the commodity risk themselves. They weren't able to parse it out or de-risk it with some of their buyers, and therefore when there were supply chain issues, uh, they wound up really crunched. Do you guys do it differently? Uh, you should definitely have me all, more often in this uh, studio if, you, if, you are, if you're catching those kind of frustrations. We do. We I want you. Come back all the here. time. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. But, but, but as I said here, uh, let's, let's just pause for a second. One thing is that the pricing and the volatility in the, in the markets went uh, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty violent. But, but there is also a physical market. Uh, hey, it seems like we, when we stand here today, we almost forgot how it was. I mean, societies was closed down. Harbors, access to harbors was closed down. You had container ships standing, lying outside that couldn't access harbors. You couldn't really progress the agreements we were making. And even though over the last three years we delivered all the turbines to our customers on site, we have had exceptions uh, to construct it. So therefore, if the last three years is a general trend of where we are, that, that's not risk-taking. That is just dealing under force majeure-like uh, conditions. Yep. And there, I'm, I'm, I have to say, yesterday was one of the most touching moments uh, I've had as an executive because uh, 29,500 colleagues really felt, listen, we are coming out of something that has been incredibly, incredibly hard day in, day out for nearly three and a half years and just feel that the plan succeeded but we are not at the end. This was a great milestone. We are now in black numbers, but there is a lot more to come. And, and that means the plan worked. Yep. Um, so uh, I don't buy into the context when people can't foresee a Russia invading uh, Ukraine, then it has some implications for Russian manufactured steel that, hey, come on, if somebody knew that was going on, uh, you can come and work for me and, and I'll pay you a, a lot of money for it. But, but then you are somebody that looks into the future and always yeah. right. Uh, we run an industrial company. We do more of it. It's been great to see you. I have, uh, I have one little thing. Yeah. 
I only have one free turbine left, and that's for you. So when I that's come back in the studio, then you have a little bit standing here. That's uh, Henrik, thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. Good to see you. So stock finishing the day here in Europe, generally and broadly a positive picture. Yesterday we were talking about uh, Denmark being the highlight today. Some of that comes out of that market, but broadly across Europe we're looking at a positive picture. The CAC Quarante is up by 1.2%, DAX up by 8 tenths, 7 tenths of 1%. Similar story for the FTSE 100. AstraZeneca having a good day there. Um, we'll talk more about some of these single stocks in just a moment. In terms of the way that the session has developed, we've been basically climbing left to right, and we're up by 8 tenths of 1%. If this stock market rally is going to continue, it needs to get a little bit of momentum, and that is going to be critical over the next few days. We have rallied significantly over the last few days. When, are we at the point yet where other people are going to start to get sucked in, the CTAs, etc.? We're starting to see evidence maybe somewhere of that. Adyen up by nearly 40% today, but bear in mind that back in August, this was a stock. This fintech got absolutely slammed as it had to change guidance. Today we get an investor day. Today the company comes out with more realistic targets, according to the analyst community, and a detailed plan to get there. The, the market has responded quite strongly to this. The stock has bounced, but it really doesn't unwind all of the losses we saw earlier on in the summer. Also, Trader, interesting, the, the, the mix is working really well, but I think the big takeaway here is just the stability we're seeing in the residuals, the used car market in the UK, which I think is interesting as well. Airbus, we got the numbers this time yesterday. The stock down 2% today. There was a little bit of a miss on the EBIT line, but actually, just keep an eye over the next few days. We're going into the Dubai Air Show. That happens kind of, let's call it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. It's going to be interesting to see what the order story looks like. Just keep an eye on this. You could see, therefore, a little bit of a bumpy ride for Airbus and its stock over the next few days, both positive and potentially negative. Let's talk about what comes up over the next few days. Sorry, the next day. GDP is out of the UK. That's going to be interesting. The UK economy has held up better than anticipated, but trying to figure out what the data are at the moment around the UK economy I think is actually a bigger challenge than anything else. But, but we are seeing inflation coming down. GDP has actually been more stable. Is this a stagflationary environment? The Paris Peace Port Forum kicks off. We've got Allianz earnings as well. And then we get numbers coming out from Richemont. This is Cartier. This is the luxury sector. Um, Yelena Sokolova, senior equity analyst, joining us from Morningstar to talk about the stock. She's got a buy rating on Richemont. She's got a price target of 154 Swiss francs. Yelena, great to see you. So the, the rest of the luxury sector has painted a reasonably cautious picture. Is that what we get from, from, from Richemont as well? Yeah, I should think so, especially that uh, they are generally quite uh, bearish in their commentary typically. But I would think that uh, they should uh, still continue seeing this deceleration, especially in the developed market. Uh, however, Chinese consumers should provide some offset, and Richemont is more exposed to Chinese consumer, and they're more exposed to also a bit more affluent consumers that should right. be faring a bit better. I mean, what we've seen, though, is the consumer part of China just still being pretty terrible. Uh, we saw consumer prices enter deflation yet again. And I'm just wondering, when are we, are we going to hear any signs of stabilization, say, in the Cartier area, like the high, high-end market in China? Yeah, so the high end actually from the uh, companies that have, have reported so far has not been that bad. Uh, for instance, it has been up 40% plus and, or 50% on kind of two-year stack for companies like LVMH or Moncler. Uh, so uh, the difference here is that Chinese consumers also are spending more abroad. So the travel is back. So that impacts the numbers in Asia. But overall, I would still see a uh, Chinese luxury consumer as relatively resilient. In terms of how we think about the consumer, you think about Cartier, you think about these high-end brands that they've got. What is, the, what is the consumer they're more exposed to? Is it the economy or is it financial markets? Because at the moment, kind of financial markets are holding up. The, the signs that the economy is slowing. But if we don't get a big crack in financial markets, does that mean that these kinds of stocks continue to do well? Because that's, that's where most of the people that buy this stuff derive a lot of their income from. Yeah, so with Chinese consumers specifically, they are also impacted by the real estate. Of course, yep. uh, downturns in real estate in 2015 preceded this big slowdown in luxury. So weakness here now is, is a headwind. 
Um, I would say that uh, overall longer term, of course, um, the luxury sector is linked to GDP and global wealth creation. Short term, of course, volatility in the market and sentiment uh, for consumers can also impact the results. Historically, the sector has been cyclical, but it also rebounds quite fast from uh, the downturns that it had historically. Okay. So to that point, like, where are we then uh, in the cycle? Like, what's price? Obviously, since the beginning of the summer, it's been a slow grind down. We're obviously off the low lows, but nowhere near where we were. We thought that China was coming back with vigor. Like, what's in the price? Yeah, I think that normalization is kind of, uh, it, is, it is looking more normal now than it was in the past three years because past three years have been impacted. They were really weird, impacted by very, very strong demand in uh, developed markets that we have not seen as sustainable, boosted by all these foregone experiences, by payment checks, etc., etc. Chinese uh, consumption is still below pre-pandemic levels. It still is recovering quite well, as I mentioned, but it is not having the the, the boost that uh, uh, Western consumption had post-pandemic. So that is the main um, kind of uh, difference from what markets were expecting in the beginning of the year. And I also think that uh, actually the demand in developed markets is weaker, which uh, we thought was plausible, but the markets probably have not anticipated to the same extent. I think we saw one of the big brands the other day buying uh, another jewellery workshop. And I'm wondering what the kind of the barriers to entry are in this space, the, the more it kind of consolidates, the harder it must be for others to break in and for more control of pricing to kind of sit at the center of the industry in companies like Richemont and LVMH. Yeah, I would say that for jewelry specifically, the barriers to entry are extremely high because, uh, first of all, there are only a handful of really established global uh, luxury jewelry uh, brands. All of them are kind of 100 years uh, old, yeah. and there is a requirement for working capital, plus uh, people tend to buy them for a long t a time. It kind of is investment of passion, which tends to benefit established brands. And that's why uh, the barriers to entry uh, enter really are super high and also which justifies uh, all this, um, you know, high multiples mm -hmm. yeah. that LVMH paid multiples. for, for, for <laughs> Tiffany and Bull, yeah. yeah. right? But the growth is still there and uh, super high entry barriers. Yeah, and it was LVMH for an eyewear brand, so, so speaking of. Um, quick question, and this is totally talking my book because I love shopping on Ux and Etaporte and uh, Richemont is trying to sell that part off or its stake to Farfetch. Where are we in that process and is that a catalyst at all for Richemont? Yeah, we, uh, we expect to hear some more uh, from, from them tomorrow on that because the deal has been approved by, uh, by the European Union. Uh, the good thing is uh, that already um, this company is not consolidated in, this, in their results, so they're a bit less of a drag. And um, the online space in luxury, but also online space everywhere in apparel has been uh, extremely hard hit now post-pandemic, uh, was boom time post-pandemic, but now they are facing a really a slower growth and lower capital availability. So it's a tough space at the moment. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much indeed for stopping by. Really appreciate it. We'll Thank see you. what those numbers deliver tomorrow. tomorrow. Yelena Sokolova, uh, Senior Equity Analyst, joining us at Morningstar in advance of the Richemont figures. European stocks are done for the day. We're going into Friday. Another decent session. There you go. Those are the numbers. The FTSE 100 uh, up by 7 tenths of 1%, pushed by uh, the AstraZeneca story today. Was it the obesity news? Was it the underlying numbers? DAX up by 8 tenths. The CAC Quarante in Paris up by 1.1%. What are we going to talk about next? Disney investors whistling like Steamboat Willie after the company's fourth quarter <laughs> earnings. Details next. Steamboat Willie. I don't this think I know great. what that is. This is Bloomberg Markets. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up, KPMG's chief economist, Diane Swank, joining Bloomberg Television today at 2 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. We expect that Hulu on Disney Plus will result in increased engagement, greater advertising opportunities, lower churn, and reduced customer acquisition costs, thereby increasing our overall margins. 
That was, of course, the Disney CEO, Bob Iger, speaking on the analyst call. Disney shares rising the most of the year. The company reported a profit beat. It promised to cut $2 billion more in expenses. For more on Disney, we are joined, as ever, by Geetha Ranganathan, media analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Geetha, just the stock response has been very positive. Can you walk me through, kind of break down for me the component parts of that? What has been the main driver of that move that we're seeing today? Yeah, so we're really seeing a, a big shift in, in sentiment and investor sh sentiment, Guy. And a, a big part of that, I think, is, of course, from the cost cuts that you alluded to, but, but a bigger driver, I think, is just the free cash flow guidance. Uh, so, you know, we were at $1 billion in fiscal 22 in free cash flow. They are actually upping that now to $8 billion next year. And that's just a combination of them extracting a lot of efficiencies, you know, within the Disney content engine, kind of really cutting down on content costs pretty significantly, as well as on non-content costs. Uh, so really efficiency was, I think, the name, was kind of the buzzword and the name of the game yesterday. But isn't that just short term? Like we have the writer strike. It looks like there's finally a deal. Also, uh, Bob Iger says they're going to an era of fixing to building. If you build stuff, you spend money. <laughs> so yes, yes and no. So uh, you know they are they they did commit to spending about sixty billion dollars in capital expenditure over the next ten years for for the parks business. But that's going to be coming you know more down the line. Uh, I think over the next few years, what they're really looking to do is kind of streamline the content cost engine. So what they spoke about was dropping about uh, or, or uh, yeah, dropping about two billion dollars in content costs, so taking it down from about twenty seven billion this year to twenty five billion. So basically, I mean, if you uh, off that twenty five billion, you've got to remember, Alex, ten billion is just for sports rights on ESPN. So when you look at the non sports part of it, it's fifteen billion that they're spending in content, which puts them, actually in a better spot than Netflix. Netflix plans to spend about $17 billion next year. And really what Bob Iger was saying is it has to be, the, the focus now has yep. to be on quality over quantity. Hmm. Geetha, who's responsible for this share price move that we're seeing today? Is it Bob Iger or is it Nelson Peltz? I think, I think it, it is Bob Iger. I mean, he's been working hard for about a year now. It's been a year since he kind of came back and, and he's really looked to kind of fix the business. And he's, I think he's done really all that he can. Of course, I think, you know, Pelts uh, coming earlier in, in February and then again coming back more recently, I think has definitely helped expedite the process. Uh, but it really, I, I, I give full credit to, to Bob Iger and his team. Um, what did you think of the potential agreement for writers and then now actors? So I don't know the whole details yet. I mean, we know that one of the big holdouts was definitely the use of AI and kind of the actors pushing back on that. Uh, you know, the, the studios obviously were, were kind of looking at the streaming tariffs that the, the actors yep. kind of wanted. So it looks like they've kind of reached some middle ground there. Uh, you know, the, the SAG-AFTRA union, of course, was touting that yep. they have received, uh, you know, one of the biggest increases ever. Again, not really sure of all the details, but it looks like finally some kind of middle ground was reached. Geeta, let's talk about Hulu. Are we at the beginning of the rebundling of media? Very much so. Very much so. I, you know, it's not just Hulu. So Hulu is, of course, in the works right now. Uh, you know, we know that um, Disney is going to buy that 33% stake from Comcast. That 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 is going to work out over the next few months. But I think ultimately, what we're really, you know, kind of seeing with Disney is, of course, you have D Disney Plus. You're going to have Hulu integrated into the Disney Plus app. But then the bigger move is really going to be what are they doing with ESPN? And I think ultimately, and this is what Bob Iger kind of alluded to as well, was have that streaming. Bundle that makes it an absolute must-have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when when it kind of comes to to all of the different streaming platforms out there. So, really, kind of dominate the streaming space with a four quadrant approach, with you know, content for everybody. Yeah, I mean, depends on how much stomach there is for Star Wars and Marvel too. <laughs> like what they're going to do after that. Gita, thanks a lot. Gita Ranganathan of Bloomberg Intelligence. Appreciate it. Let's turn to some other stories that we're looking at. Uh, MGM beating third quarter estimates, boosting its share buyback by about $2 billion. Look at the stock, though, uh, down by about five-tenths of 1%. Also, you have Wynn uh, Resorts going to be reporting after the bell today. Want to bring in Jody Lurie of Bloomberg Intelligence, who covers gaming and casinos. What do you make of MGM, uh, and, and why is the stock down? I mean, it looked relatively solid here. <laughs> 
Sure. So I think, Alex, I mean, you know, as a credit analyst, we always sort of say, well, don't look at the stock, look at the bonds. Um, I, th I think really that it comes down to that. So here's a company that is spending a tremendous amount on share buybacks. They're going to be spending a tremendous amount on CapEx, and they're focusing on growing the company. There's a lot of positive momentum going on with the company, but they're trying to balance it out. So they're not paying dividends. They're doing share buybacks to have a little bit more flexibility. Now, that's a positive from a credit perspective. What isn't a positive is the fact that they are so laden in debt. We're not talking about actual debt. We're talking about operating leases. And I think that's always going to be a point of contention between us and management. Um, Jody, I, I spent a lot of time talking to airlines. And the long-haul stuff is still working, but short-haul is mm -hmm. beginning to show signs of weakness. How does that translate into hotels? Sure. So I think for the hotels, you know, we, we do cover a bunch of the major hotels. We also cover uh, the casinos. And I think in both cases, we're seeing this conversation around regional travel. We're seeing a question about cross-border travel. I mean, Marriott, when they reported, they talked about the fact that cross-border border is still returning. Conferences and events are definitely picking up. I mean, you see that evident in Vegas. You see that evident in key markets, Macau, obviously, with the reopening. You're also seeing it just in a lot of these sort of major areas, such as, you know, Miami. That said, I mean, I think there is a little bit sort of uh, hesitancy, hesitancy around our prospects for next year. I think there's a lot of uncertainty, at least heading into the second half of next year, even if the first half seems really strong. Um, OK, what about when? What are you looking for when, when, when win reports? That's hard to say. Yes, when win reports. So win has been, we would kind of look at our casino names sort of uh, across the spectrum, right? There's the companies that have been done with the debt refinancing, getting their balance sheet in order, and now are focused on giving back to shareholders. You have your, your Las Vegas Sands that fits in that bucket. You have your MGM, which wants to be in that bucket. And then you have Caesars, which is still focusing on debt repayments, which we see as a, a positive sign. And then you have win, which is also focused on debt repayments, but has been a little bit slower to generate cash flow because of their massive Macau exposure. So much of their EBITDA comes from Macau. And so the reopening this year has been a very positive situation for them. But the change in, in concessions, the change in licensing has been a little bit of a question mark in terms of how it's going to look now versus what it looked like post pre-pandemic. What's the long-term story with, with those companies that have this kind of exposure to China? How are investors, how should investors be perceiving that? Sure. So, Guy, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I know the, uh, you know, one of the speakers who came on before me was talking about some of the softness in China or the questions about China and, and you know, the economy there. And we actually, we sat down with management at MGM, for example, a few weeks ago, and they talked about how they feel very comfortable about Macau because when you think about it, and, and we, we sort of subscribe to this idea to some extent. Cecilia Chan, who's my colleague in, in Asia, she writes about this as well, is that the concept is, is that the people who are going to Macau are those luxury spenders. The people who are going to Macau aren't necessarily going to be affected by an economic slowdown the same way that the general population in China is. So this pent up demand is sort of offsetting a lot of the sort of economic headwinds that we might see. Now, whether or not that persists past 2024 is certainly a question, but it does at least provide some tailwinds to offset the headwinds. Jody, that was great. Really appreciate it. Jody Lurie of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. Stocks up again. Uh, so you have the S&P now trying to eke out that gain. It would be nine straight days of gains. We know the superlative, the longest streak we've seen since 2004. Abigail's tracking all of that for us. Abigail? Yeah, and a choppy day, a very small move. So this is the S&P 500 E-mini futures overnight. Not doing very much, and then small moves to the upside around the time of the open up about a quarter of a percent and then down a quarter of a percent. So on an intraday basis, about a half a percent of intraday volatility and up, now up ever so slightly. It seems like we'll be on the edge of our seats right until uh, the bell to see whether or not uh, we can have that big superlative that Alex was just talking about. Now, if we look beneath the surface over the last two weeks or essentially in the month of uh, November here, take a look at the S&P 500, this rally off of the 200-day moving average. Uh, pretty impressive at this point, up 6.1%. Take a look at tech, up 11.2%. 
percent as investors want back in on the sector that was beaten down for a couple of months. Many were, but of course, with the Magnificent Seven, what makes it interesting, I would argue that those quarters were sort of mixed. Energy, though, really the only sector down so far in the month of November, down 4.6 percent. And take a look at oil back below $80 a barrel with a 75 handle. This isn't so surprising relative to the technicals. We took a look at this chart before the big breakdown. Here is basically a neckline on a topping pattern telling you that the people who bought well or all the way back there, that they thought that we could maybe see oil go back down. So they're taking profits, but not in such a way to really develop or uh, I should say uh, make their profits fall apart, uh, doing it more on the slide. You can see a breakdown here and a breakdown here. Right now, oil is actually confirmed to go back below 80. And I would say from a fundamental standpoint, uh, Alex would certainly know better than me, but I would say a piece of it is perhaps the expectation that the Israel-Hamas war right now, the conflict in the Middle East, maybe not interrupting the oil supply at this time. As for what investors like for stocks, here's yields. When we put this together, Guy, with the fact that oil's down, the last two weeks or so from a fundamental real world perspective has been sort of anti-inflationary. I don't know if the word's disinflationary or stagflation, but uh, yeah, inflation measures seem to be coming down at least right now. Are they going to stay down? That's the critical question. That is what everybody needs to figure out. Not convincing yet that the data are ultimately going to take us back down to 2% and stay there. Is that now the floor? Uh, Abigail, thank you very much indeed. What are we watching? The November WASDE report, one of Alex's favourites, mm -hmm. is going to be true. coming out. Uh, WASDE, that's, that's the agricultural report, right? It's the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Boom. I knew you'd have that. I yeah, knew you'd have that. <laughs> Biden visiting uh, a UAW plant uh, in Illinois. We saw the comments earlier. Uh, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, speaks. Mike was saying us, telling us that this might be actually at a museum, so we maybe shouldn't expect too much in terms of policy. Powell speaking, though, at the IMF conference. There we might see some pushback from the markets and what they've done of late. We will see. Okay. But, uh, and, is there something you want to talk about? Something else you want to, you want to talk uh, about? I, 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 this is great. Look at this. What's that on your desk? You don't guy? have one of these. You don't have one of these. <laughs> you I don't, don't have understand. one of these, do you? I talk about the energy transition all the time. I'm on call after call, and this guy gets a toy wind turbine. This feels totally not cool. I, I honestly, genuinely very happy with this. This is going to have pride of place on my desk. This is, this is the Vestas... Vestas wind turbine that Henry gave me a little bit earlier on. Look at that. That's amazing. That's that, so uh, honestly, mean. pride of place. Apparently, they had a few issues getting this through security, airport security this morning. Really? So, that is yeah. interesting. So they had to, that's very sharp. Very sharp there. Anyway. Okay. You can come and visit it. <laughs>